three. Oh. Alrighty. Ready? Okay. So the next of uh, the pagan Sabbaths is the Feast of Ishtar, or better known as Easter. Now, Easter is the Queen of Heaven. She's known by several names Ishtar, Astarte, Asherah. The Greeks know her as uh, the Aphrodite. Artemis of the Ephesians, Athena, Demeter, Gaia, Hera, Hestia, Rhea, Cayune of the Moabites, Venus of the Romans, Diana, Minerva, Ceres, Terra, Juno, Vesta, Ops. The thing that's always constant is the halo or the sun disk around her head. Looking at the two Babylons, Pages 103, it says this, and I quote, Then look at Easter. What means the term Easter itself? And this is a question I remember asking my Sunday school teacher. Where do we get the term Easter? It bears the Chaldean origin on its very forehead. Easter is nothing else but Ashtarte, one of the titles of Beltus, the Queen of Heaven. The origin of the Easter egg is just as clear. The ancient Druids bore an egg as a sacred emblem of their order. In ancient times, eggs were used in the religious rites of the Egyptians and the Greeks and were hung up for the mystic purposes in their temples. From Egypt, these sacred eggs can be distinctly traced to the banks of the Euphrates. The classic poets are full of the fables of the mystics of the Babylonians, and thus its tale is told by Hegenus the Egyptian, the learned keeper of the Palatine Library in Rome in the time of Augustus who was skilled in all the wisdom of his native country. An egg of wondrous size is said to have fallen from the heavens into the river Euphrates. The fish rolled it up onto the banks where the doves, having settled upon it and hatched it, came out Venus, who afterwards was called the Syrian goddess, that is Astarte. Hence the egg became one of the symbols of Astarte, or Easter. End of quote. The two Babylons, pages 103, 108, and 109. Ashtarte or Ishtar was worshipped as the mother of God and the queen of heaven. Reverend Hislop goes on to say, and I quote in the two Babylons, This pagan symbol, the cross, is the Tav, the sign of the cross, the indisputable sign of Tammuz, the false messiah, the mystic, the mystic Tav of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians and the Egyptians, the true origin of the letter T, and the initial of the name of Tammuz. The Babylonian cross was the recognized emblem of Tammuz. End of quote. The two Babylons, page 197 to 205. So every time you look at someone with that cross around their neck, you can think to your mind, they think it's representative of the crucifixion, but in reality, it's nothing more than a T, the T for Tammuz. With the birth of the Babylonian Antichrist came the traditional celebration of his birthday after the winter solstice on December the 25th. When Tammuz reached his 40th year, he was killed by a wild boar. His worshippers lamented over his death for 40 days, one day for each of his years. Before he was resurrected or reincarnated, this established a new ritual of worship by offering wafers to the Queen of Heaven. Forty days of abstinence or Lent to memorialize the weeping for Tammuz, followed by a feast to celebrate his resurrection. During these celebrations, the people would exchange Ishtar eggs dipped in the blood of the sacrificial newborns to symbolize new life. So the dying of the eggs, whereas now is just various forms of coloring, in the ancient time was literally the blood of of the newborn babies offered up in sacrifice. The Easter sunrise service is derived from the ancient pagan practice of worshiping the sun on the morning of the spring equinox, marking the beginning of spring. What we know, what we now call Easter lilies, were revered by the ancients as symbols of fertility 
and representative of the male genitalia. The ancient Babylonian religions had rituals involving dyed eggs, as did the ancient Egyptians. The triumph of the consistent Roman Catholic over the observance of Sunday, calling themselves Protestants, is indeed complete and unanswerable. And this is a quote. It should present a subject of a very grave reflection to Christians of the Reformed Evangelical denominations to find that no single argument or suggestion can be offered in favor of Sunday observance that will not apply with equal force and to the fullest extent in the sustainings of the various other holy days appointed by the church. End of quote. Obligation of the Sabbath, pages 254 to 255. So Mystery Babylon, this false religion, says that they had a right to change the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day, and that goes for all the rest of the holy days. Because we can do it, we do do it. Because we're the queen of heaven, we can do it. Because we killed the family of Yeshua and martyred the saints, we can do it because there's no one to raise their voice against us. So, these holy days of Mystery Babylon are nothing new. It's the same old apostation. But does it really matter? Does Yahweh really care? It's just a bunch of silliness. It doesn't matter, does it? Listen to what the word says. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Messiah? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Messiah? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Now that's talking about Passover. Not something new. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? Talking about the Aaronic priests, that when they partake of those sacrifices upon Yahweh's altar, are they not in communion? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Can we then apply that to, the, to idol worship? Or what is offered to an idol is anything? Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. You mean Ishtar? There's a demon behind that idol? The Easter egg, there's a, a demon behind that fallacy? The jolly old Saint Nicholas, there's a, there's a demon behind that cultural phenomenon? It's easy to see in Halloween after all, isn't it? What the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons and not to Yahweh. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of Yahweh and the cup of demons. You cannot celebrate Yahweh's holy days and the holidays of the Christians. You cannot partake of Yahweh's table and the table of demons. Or do we provoke Yahweh to jealousy? Remember what he says. I am Yahweh. I am a jealous Elohim. Are we stronger than he? I'll answer that. No. 1 Corinthians 10, 16-22. Look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods? You have not known. Other gods you have not known. And then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, we're safe, safe to do all these detestable things. Jeremiah 7, 8 through 10. No, you can't. You can't do those things. Yahweh is a jealous Elohim and he says, come out of her. But as for you who forsake Yahweh and forget my holy mountain, who spread a table or an altar to God, the Babylonian deity of luck, and fill bowls mixed of wine for Mime or destiny, the Babylon, Babylonian god of fate and fortune, 
I will destine you for the sword and you will all bend down for the slaughter for I called but you didn't answer. I spoke but you didn't listen. You did evil in my sight and choose what displeases me. Isaiah 65, 11 and 12. He told us what pleases him, keeping the Sabbath and don't pollute it. Love his name and hold fast to his covenant in Isaiah 56. In Isaiah 65, he says, this is what displeases me, spreading an altar to God and pouring out wine to Mene. Because what you realize is these pagan gods are nothing more than Moloch, the ancient demon of the Middle East. The religious myth is one of the most powerful devices ever created and it serves as the intellectual soil where other manipulative myths can flourish. A myth is an idea, though widely believed, is false. In a religious sense, a myth serves as an orienting, mobilizing story for a people. The story does not center itself on reality, but on function. A myth cannot function unless it's believed to be true. It is not a matter of debate. If someone has the bad taste to challenge the truth of the religious story, the keepers of the myth do not enter into a debate with them. They are ignored and marginalized and denounced as crazy, or better yet, blasphemers. When a person celebrates Christmas or any other pagan festival, which was and still is motivated by the forces of evil, they are honoring the demons who conceived that pagan festival in the first place. Demons who are totally open opposed to the Holy Spirit and who go out of their way to prompt mankind into committing all kinds of evil at their winter and spring festivals. In other words, the so-called spirit of Christmas or Xmas, because <laughs> it really doesn't have anything to do with the anointed of Israel, is not the Holy Spirit of Yahweh, but the spirit of greed, drunkenness, violence, and debauchery, all of which are the hallmarks of the pagan holidays. Yahweh your Elohim will cut off before you the nations you are about to invade and dispossess. But when you have driven them out and settled in their land, after they have destroyed, been destroyed before you, be careful not to be ensnared by inquiring about their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods? And we'll do the same. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and burn their Asherah poles in the fire. Cut down the idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. You must not worship Yahweh, your Elohim, in their way. Deuteronomy 12, 3-4. We're not even allowed to worship Yahweh in the way the pagans worship their gods. So you can't spiritualize or anoint pagan holidays and call them good. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people! Quoting Jeremiah 51, 45 and Revelations 18 and 4. We've got to hear the call. He said, I'll whistle for Ephraim, which is lost Israel, spread out and all to the world. I'll whistle for Ephraim, and Ephraim will come. Have you heard the call? It is our responsibility to make sure the call is heard, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from the darkness of the, pri the prisoners. Isaiah 61 and 2. What prisoners? Those that are oppressed by this world and the dark forces of this world. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling for demons and the haunt of every impure spirit. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven and Yahweh has remembered her crimes. Come out of her, my people so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. 
for her sins are piled up to heaven and Yahweh has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay back her double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as a queen. I'm not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is Yahweh our Elohim, who judges her. Revelations 18, 2, 4, 5 through 8. Come out of her. Touch not the filthy things. Be ye holy, for Yahweh is holy. Learn not the way of the heathen. You must not worship Yahweh your Elohim in their way. Come out of her, my people. That's my message. Are there any questions about what we studied today? Any questions? <laughs> it is pretty simple to understand yeah okay go ahead go ahead comment oh we got a comment sorry well you were talking about how that we, we cannot do anything with any of these pagan celebrations mm -hmm. and and some people don't realize, too, it says that he doesn't even want you, Yahweh says, to not even take their name on your lips. Mm -hmm. doesn't even want you to say their name. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's why we have to change the calendar mm. to make it, because <laughs> the, the calendar is nothing but a shrine of, of, of uh, pagan idols and false gods. So what you're trying to say is that um, Sunday was the, religious day of the worship of the sun, right. hello us. Then Monday was the Sabbath of the moon for the pagans, yeah. moon day. And then Tuesday was Zeus day. Yeah. And then Wednesday was Woden day. Yeah. And Thor's day was the Thursday. Store, yeah. And Freitag. It was Freitag yeah. or Frieden on Friday. Now then you had those that worshipped on Saturn, or worshipped Saturn, Saturn yeah. on Saturn's day. And then we're back to Sunday again. And the names of the months are about the same. Yeah, most of them have to do with this, with, with this Caesar's family. You the had who claimed to be a god. That's right. You had Augustus and Octavius and Julian. Yeah. Uh, so you had July, that's October, and that's August. Um, and then there's other names for the other months, but... Um, yeah, it's this is why. Remember what Isaiah said? Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. The reality of it, if you really if you want to get real down and ugly, nearly every word in pagan tongues. Why do you think we say good? That that's good. Because it's like God and God's good. No, God is a is a idol. Yahweh, on the other hand, is all that is good, is according to what Yeshua said. No one's good except Yahweh. So we can't say we can't even say good without borrowing from God, from the word God. So that's why Isaiah said, "I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips." In fact, I can't talk to Yahweh without using words that have etymological origins in pagan worship. That's why he said when he comes back, he will give us a pure language, a language totally stripped of pagan words. Because even in Hebrew, words have snuck in. I can't say that it, that it have, hasn't because I can tell you that it has. It has the less amount of pagan words, but it does have pagan words in them. Just because we lived amongst pagans and we borrowed yeah you can sort of it's just hard to it's hard to talk to someone by saying well first day second day Thursday 
<laughs> yeah. Um, or saying, you know, first month, second month, you know. Uh, and you can't use Hebrew months because they wouldn't know what you're talking about. So I, I, I can, it's hard. We're living, and we're amongst the people of unclean lips. What we can do is not worship like they can. We can abstain from false worship. We can abstain from the obvious, like you said. And, um, and that which we can do, we do do. And then, uh, but even if we stripped everything out, there would still be enough in there. Because if you, <laughs> we wouldn't be talking at all if, if, if we used words, if we didn't have words uh, that had pagan origins. So. Well, that's why, we, that's why we're told not to live after the flesh or the evil inclination but to walk in the spirit, which would cause us to, our good inclination to rise. Um, is that, are we successful in that? Um, not often. <laughs> how, many, how many of you have sought out in the day, well, I am going to walk in the spirit today. And then by the end of the day, you broke your heart. <laughs> well, me... Tony, we don't have that problem, do we? <laughs> Some women. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> but it is, it seriously, it is a, a problem. Uh, and that's why we need the Messiah to come back so much. I mean, we think we know why we need the Messiah, but we need, for, we meet, we need the Messiah for things we don't even know. We need, we need to be holy. And he, he, that's our goal. He said, be holy like I'm holy. Well, he, how many of you know I'm not going to be like Yahweh? I'm going to try. But he's perfect. But it's my goal. Yeah. Amen. Well, let's all stand. Oh, man. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who created all beings and their needs for all that you created to sustain these beings. Blessed be the one who lives forever. You said, when you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless Yahweh, your Elohim, for the good land which he has given you in Deuteronomy 8 and 10. We are full in the natural sense because we have re received such a blessing in our feast today. We're also full spiritually. Because Yahweh has given us nuggets out of his word. Blessed are you Yahweh our Elohim. King of the universe. Who nourishes the entire world. In your grace and mercy. You give nourishment to all flesh. For your kindness is eternal. Our compassionate one. Through your great goodness. We have never lacked. May we never lack nourishment for all eternity. For the sake of your great name. You prepare food for all the creatures that you have created. We thank you for your provisions with which you nourish and sustain us constantly every day and in every season. May your great name, O Yahweh, be blessed by the mouth of all the living continually for all eternity. Blessed are you, Yahweh, my Elohim, who nourishes all creation. Amen and Amen. B'Shem Yeshua. Father, we thank you again for your people. And we thank you that we were able to dine upon your word. Let us assimilate that into the marrow of our bones and let us practice it in Yeshua's name. We'll come again in faithfulness, again on your Sabbath day. And we'll proclaim liberty to the captives and set those free out of bondage. That's our job, to proclaim the kingdom. And then the end may come. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. Okay. No, we already ate.